someone we imagine to be very saintly may go to hell, or someone may go to paradise who one never imagined would ever make it. In other words, it can never be clear. It's therefore unlawful to issue pronouncements about people on Allah's behalf. No Muslim can say such things. In the absence of any clear revelation, in the absence of any prophets with books of revelation saying that someone will go to paradise, nobody can be certain of the future. But even though our prophet, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, was told he would be going to paradise, he was still punctilious about his religious observances and obeying Allah's commands. Muslims will be like that. They will fear Allah, saying they have a 50-50 chance of going to paradise or to hell. This is also the root of love and passion. We learn this passion through love of Allah. Fear of Allah is the origin of profound love. We will constantly praise Allah in the hereafter, thanks be to Allah, Alhamdulillah, Allah is beyond any flaws. We will each time be in awe, O oh Lord, we love you very much, we will say. We will say, we are in love with you, constant expressions of joy, Alhamdulillah, how great is Allah, we will say. We will constantly praise Him, praise of Allah will predominate in paradise, but there will be no salat, regular prayer, no fasting, there will be no giving alms, because everywhere will already be so wealthy, but fear of Allah will persist because people will constantly see hell but there will be no question of believers going to hell as believers fear Allah they will fear Allah under whatever circumstances they will fear Allah for all eternity but they will have a huge appreciation of paradise inshallah Yes, our Prophet wasallam saw the realm of hereafter, but Allah did not show him paradise. Allah showed him hell. He saw hell and gave thanks to Allah and made his comparisons. Because having seen paradise, the influence of this world may be quite burdensome. That is, having a physical liking for other people or this world may be very difficult because one will have compared them with paradise. That's why our Prophet ﷺ was not shown paradise while he was in this world. In paradise, will women be married to their husbands in this world? Of course, Allah says they will be under the trees with their husbands and children. Of course they will be with their husbands. What if she has been married two or three times? Allah will give her the person with the greatest fear of Allah, he whom Allah approves of most. That is Allah's criterion. We must look for the greatest measure of His approval in all things. I mean, I could come here or sit at home or else go out to the shops and talk to people. I think Allah will most approve of my coming here. And I think I am doing the right thing. In other words, something has its most truthful and very best form. That is what Allah wants. The very best of something is what most meets with Allah's approval. That will also be the criterion for spouses in the hereafter. Allah will give them to the person who most seeks his approval. If a person's spouse is pure and immaculate, and if that person has moral virtue and is a believer, then of course they will be together in paradise. Almighty Allah makes that clear in verses. He says they are together with their spouses and children. Of course they will be together in the hereafter. People will have children in the hereafter. A person will be able to give birth whenever she wants a baby after a very brief pregnancy. But it will involve no pain and will happen right away. It will happen the moment they desire it. That's the future of paradise. Let me say that what counts is one's position regarding faith in Allah, one's degree of belief in Allah. It doesn't matter to Allah whose spouse it is. For example, Abu Laheb's wife shared the same mindset and mentality for a rich put in the same place. 
But Pharaoh's wife was a believer and a chaste woman, and one worthy of paradise. She left him and didn't espouse his views. She didn't espouse his logic, his immoral philosophy. She followed along with the Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, and Allah has sent her to paradise. The Prophet Noah's wife, for instance, was a most abnormal woman, and Allah has put her in hell. Allah separated her from Noah, peace be upon him. Lot's wife was the same, and an unbeliever. Allah separated them. We can see from these few examples that it is fear of Allah to which Allah attaches importance. For example, an immoral person has a wife, a chaste believer. That woman leaves her husband, and Allah doesn't regard their union as valid. He separates them in the hereafter. She counts as single in the hereafter, and Allah will marry her to a male believer who has fear of Allah, whoever he regards as most desirous of his approval. Therefore, Allah's approval is the main criterion in such matters. In fact, Allah shows what we are. Allah appears to test what we are, but that is not actually the case. Looked at it in terms of ilm al ladun the knowledge of divine providence, that is not the case. Because Allah knew what we would do. He has sent us to paradise or to hell. So there is actually no question of being tested, of Allah investigating and learning about us. Allah already knows about us. He shows us to ourselves, shows us what we are. And we will experience the joy of that in paradise. We will say, we rendered such and such a service, did this and that, but in fact, it is Allah who engages in these deeds. For example, you are now exhibiting virtuous behavior and inshallah you will go to paradise. If I see you have gone to paradise, then Allah willing, I will love you even more there. Because I will see the sacrifices you have made. I will see your virtues and lovable nature. I will know them in this world. Since I will go there with that knowledge, it will remain with me forever. And I will therefore love you forever with that knowledge. For example, one has a spouse, one sees their moral virtue, and that stays with one forever. That's why a man loves his wife more than he does Huris. It is because of that knowledge, because he has seen her altruism, her courage, her fortitude, her kindness, her religious observances, and all other kinds of behavior. Since he has absorbed that information, it will remain with him for all eternity, and he will also love that knowledge. But that's not the case with Huris. He sees no virtue in Huris in this world. Huris have to be virtuous in the hereafter. That's why people love their wives far more in the hereafter, because they see much more manifestations of Allah in her. They are in a more acceptable position. For example, our Prophet, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, refers to himself and adds Hamza, peace be upon him, Hazrat Mehdi, peace be upon him, and Hazrat Ali, peace be upon him, and the companions, saying, we are the Sayyid, that is the Lords of the people of Paradise. Why? Because they all suffered. We will love them for that in the hereafter. Why do we admire the Prophet Joseph, peace be upon him, so much in the hereafter? Because he suffered hardship. Why do we admire the Prophet Moses, peace be upon him? Because he suffered hardship. Because they displayed a powerful love of Allah, because they felt such an intense and fervent love. For example, when we look at the gardens of paradise, we will lose our senses from love. The same is with its furniture, food and drink. But the truth of the matter is that all of these things will be bestowed as images. But people will not know they are images. They will be bestowed in the greatest clarity. One will be unable even to wonder whether they might be mere images. Nobody will have the power to do that. But these things will be given as images. They will exist on the outside. But that's how people will perceive them. They will perceive them in their brains, heads and souls. But the originals, matter, will exist on the outside in paradise. The original of matter does exist in the outside world. Our Prophet, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, says the mansions of paradise resemble crystal. People move in and out of them. There are small streams all around, small streams of paradise. Paradise consists of layers. Paradise consists of perfect houses, more beautiful than one can ever imagine. We are given a glimpse in this world. The houses of this world are still created in our brains and the dwellings of paradise will also be created in our brains. The birds and animals of paradise, everything will be created in our brains. We can never have direct experience of the original of paradise. There is an original, external paradise, but we will always experience the images of it.
For instance, we now see the world, but although it is three-dimensional, the image we see is two-dimensional. There is a deficiency of this world. In paradise, the image will be very sharp and three-dimensional. It will be very clear. It's a very sound phenomenon. All senses, sounds and tastes will be very sharp and distinct. There is some kind of blurriness in this world. You cannot hear a sound that is far away, but in paradise you will hear even the most distant noise. You can see the furthest object in paradise. Myopic eyes are very weak in this world, a weakness given to human beings. For example, you can detect the most far-off scent. You can reach the furthest thing instantaneously. You don't say it is too far away to get to. For example, you see a friend in the distance and you are by his side the next moment. He might be one million kilometers away, but you are still with him instantaneously. There is a speed that is even greater than that of light, the speed of imagination. With the speed of the imagination, a person reaches his destination immediately, while one still needs to follow a specific route when traveling at the speed of light, but not there, which is created so one can be there instantaneously. By Allah's leave, these things will happen. It's useful for us to know the general logic behind all these things, though much more comprehensive information is available, of course, on the www.harunyahya.com and www harunyahya.org websites. Allah says that vision is sharper in the hereafter, that people will see more clearly in three dimensions. We can only see clearly for 400-500 meters, after which things are blurred. But in the hereafter, even things three or four kilometers away will be very sharp and clear. Allah says that our vision on that day will be very sharp. It will have an extraordinary nature. People have no internal organs, but their eyes see, their ears hear, and these things reach the brain. People will see directly without the need for anything. All natural causes will be done away with. For example, a car will run by itself without having an engine or any petrol in it. It will just go by itself. There will be illumination. Things will be illuminated without the sun. The objects in paradise light themselves. The sun is needed in this world, a direct cause. But since there are no such direct causes in the hereafter, things will illuminate themselves in the absence of direct causes. Allah says that fruit and vegetables never decrease in quantity. The moment a piece of fruit is picked, another piece appears. You can eat as much as you like and it will be replaced. Paradise is the abode of happiness. Allah cennet için hiçbir nefis tatmadı, hiçbir göz görmedi diyor. Allah says of paradise that no earthly desire has tasted and no eye seen it. It's utterly amazing and most beautiful. One of the best features of paradise is that nowhere grows old or fades and everything is positive. As you know, everything is created with its opposite in this world. Like good and bad or day and night, in paradise there will be only positive aspects. That's the artistry of Allah. The gate of paradise is uniquely beautiful. You look at the doors of the houses and they are all separately decorated. The chairs have a beauty of their own. So we look at those beauties and give constant thanks to Allah. The human soul burns with love of Allah in paradise. You look at a picture in paradise and you give thanks to Allah. You can even talk to it. You can tell it to turn a bit to the right and it will do so. And if you tell it to bring you a cool drink, it will bring you one. Pour it out, you say, and it will pour it into a glass. Go back to your place, you say, and back it goes. Paradise is very pleasant and entertaining like that. Allah has created it specially to be like that. But in this world we are bound by direct causes. I cannot bring something to me without stretching my hand out for it. I am bound by direct causes. Yet it's not my hand that brings it here. Allah creates that in my head. He creates my hand as the direct cause. There are always direct causes here. For instance, were it not for the camera here, 
they could not see me, but there is no need for cameras in heaven. It is created without direct houses. For example, in paradise, your brother can look and see you. In other words, there is no need for a camera system. For instance, it is enough for him to wish to see someone to see them. The image forms. But here, you have to turn on the television, press the buttons, and there have to be the cameras and lighting. Several direct causes have to be created, and that eliminates our free will. In other words, since we are tested, if we obtained images of everywhere without cameras, everyone would believe, and the test will be lifted. Satellite antenna and cameras are used as instruments so the test should continue, and people are not visible to us in their homes without satellite antenna and cameras. Images are created as a miracle in every home. Allah creates them as a miracle in every home. He uses the camera and satellite systems as his instruments. He creates them so people will regard the phenomenon as quite normal, though the fact is that images are directly created in everyone's brain. For example, he says, there are such mentions in paradise that people on the inside can see the outside, and those on the outside can see the inside. A mansion made entirely out of crystal, for instance. One day, the messenger said that there are such mansions in paradise that there were no hooks to hold them up and no pillars to prop them up. The people who heard this asked how the inhabitants would enter those mansions. The messenger, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, said they would fly in like birds. But here, of course, we need an engine to fly from one place to another, or a propeller, we need a direct cause. We fly but using vehicles to do so. Those vehicles do not apply in paradise. There is no need for any vehicle. Everything happens by people just thinking of it. Like in a dream, for instance, when we want to fly, we use a plane. We get in a vehicle and go to the airport and board the plane and we fly by means of the engine of the plane. The plane then lands in Ankara, say. We get our bags and a light. We experienced this all very perfectly. We later realized we were asleep and it was all a dream. But the plane there needs no petrol or diesel or anything. That's what paradise is like. This is also the case in this world. For example, I want to drink some tea. It appears that I stretch my hand out for it, though it is actually Allah who brings the cup to my lips. My hand doesn't bring the tea to me. Allah just uses it as a direct cause. It is also Allah who creates the tea in the cup. A person cannot do this. It's a law of Allah, but one that everyone who makes a deep use of his mind can comprehend. Otherwise, a person who becomes caught up with superficial direct causes imagines that everything is the result of such direct causes. He imagines that biscuits come from a factory or meat from the butcher's shop. But Allah creates the meat. It is created at that moment. You imagine it comes from the store, but Allah uses this store as a direct cause. Tables are laid. Allah sets all tables. Tables are set as a miracle, but people are unaware of this because of the direct causes involved. Since these direct causes do not apply in paradise, Fables are set all of a sudden, for it forms instantaneously. There are no direct causes involved in an object going from one place to another. For instance, the cars in paradise need no engine and petrol. They just move spontaneously. Cars in this world do need engines and petrol though. There need to be direct causes for them to move. If cars were to move without engines and petrol, people would no longer enjoy the use of their free wills and would have to have faith. But since there is no test in paradise, there are no direct causes either. Everything moves of its own accord. People just have to think of it, to imagine it for it to happen. All the objects in paradise are intelligent. They all have understanding. In order for us to turn the television on here, for instance, we press the remote and it comes on, but it's again Allah who turns the television on. A miracle takes place, though Allah appears to use the remote as a direct cause, but there are no such direct causes in paradise. For example, if you tell that flower ball to come to you, it does so. You pick a fruit from its tree and as soon as you do so, it reappears in the tree. You eat food, for instance, as you keep eating that food, it keeps reappearing in the dish. And that's perfectly logical, because Allah creates it as an image in our brains. Matter does exist on the outside, but we have direct experience of an image of it in our brains. And it's logical for the image not to come to an end. 
It would be a miracle if the image did come to an end for the food we are eating to be finished. For example, there is no dust or dirt in paradise. There is no blurring in anything we normally experience as an image. We watch a film and there is no blurring. Even if you watch the film a thousand times, it will still be pristine and the image will never be spoiled. Allah says that in the hereafter. He will cause Muslims to live in the very finest places. Allah is referring to mansions, to the tents of paradise. These are the most lovely places one can imagine. Perfect images created instinctively. When we eat fruit, we will say, this is the fruit we have always been longing for. When we see a woman there, we will say that she is the kind of woman we have always longed for. When we see a house, we will say that is the kind of house we have always longed for. Allah says there are small rivers, streams of gold running in gentle curves, as well as bigger rivers. People have a natural love of water, and Allah creates this as an instinct. For example, the sea lifts our spirit when we see it. Houses built on places with views of the sea or along the sides of lakes are always more expensive, aren't they? Allah bestows this as a heavenly instinct. We have an instinct that draws us to water, a love of water. We have a love of beautiful places, but this is never satisfied in this world, though it still exists as an instinct inside us. For instance, there are no perfect women in this world, and no perfect homes or perfect fruit, but we still feel this instinctively. When we eat an apple, we say that there must be better fruit than this somewhere, but we cannot find, yet in paradise there is the best of everything. For example, you pick an apple, but that apple is still on the branch. You eat, but you are not satisfied. And there is always food in the ball. You tell the ball to come to you, and up it gets. It is intelligent. Everything is intelligent. In fact, the mind of Allah is everywhere. But He doesn't put it into action for us here. That is what happened with the Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, staff. The mind and power of Allah are everywhere. The might of Allah was also in the Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, staff. Moses, peace be upon him, cast the staff down and Allah turned it into a snake that very moment. This is something quite extraordinary. He then told the Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, to pick it up and when he did so, it straight away turned back into a staff. Wood turns into a snake and then the snake turns back into wood. That is also how it is in paradise. Everything is conscious. For instance, whenever one wants to fly somewhere, one can do so. One can fly through the air with no wings and using no vehicle. One can travel where one wants to be instantaneously, one just has to think of that. One can travel somewhere hundreds of thousands of kilometers away in a very short space of time, in less than a second, momentarily. Since there is no space, Allah will create the place for us instantaneously. In other words, it will form in people's brains. There will be matter on the outside, but it will form in people's brains. Objects move. Whatever object you ask a question, it will give you a proper answer. You ask how it is, and it will say it is very well. Cats and dogs and rabbits. You ask what are they up to, and they will say they are walking around. Thanks be to Allah. You call them too, and they will come and sit on your shoulder. You can talk with them, and then send them off. But that consciousness exists only in paradise. There is no need for them not to be seen. Of course, they will be visible. They will appear in the guise of normal, attractive human beings, because they are also our believer brethren. They listen to our talk and benefit from us, and they also read the Quran, but they will be visible there. Demons are not visible here, but they will be visible in hell. They will all be visible. True believers go to paradise, and I tell people the secret of that. But one doesn't worship Allah simply in order to get to paradise and be happy. One performs one's religious observations to earn his approval. One's sole aim is the approval of Allah. A believer's sole aim is the approval of Allah. But if He grants us paradise, there is a blessing from Him. We are content with whatever Allah may give us. We are content with all outcomes and we submit to Allah. A believer will still be content with Allah if He sends him to hell or to paradise. Allah forbid, but even if a believer goes we imagine to be very saintly may go to hell. Or someone may go to paradise who one never imagined would ever make it.
In other words, it can never be clear. It's therefore unlawful to issue pronouncements about people on Allah's behalf. No Muslim can say such things. In the absence of any clear revelation, in the absence of any prophets with books of revelation saying that someone will go to paradise, nobody can be certain of the future. But even though our prophet, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, was told he would be going to paradise, he was still punctilious about his religious observances and obeying Allah's commands. Muslims will be like that. They will fear Allah.